All right, so thank you again for joining us. Today, we're gonna to be covering creating winning ads that drive 200% plus ROI. It's a deep dive into leveraging your digital ads to convert more leads. <laughs> All right, so with that in mind, we're gonna introduce our speakers and we're gonna start with me, cause why not? I'm the creative director at Inverb Marketing. While I manage the creative and web staff, I do get plenty of opportunities to toy around with HubSpot as well. So I have vast experience with the CMS and with the marketing tools as well. I enjoy board games, bike rides, and uh, at the end of the day, I'm an absolute workaholic. Gina. Yeah, stand here. Hi, I'm Gina in Zunza. I'm the digital marketing manager within Verb, and I love, it sounds weird, but spreadsheets, basically. <laughs> um, so I have the creative part, which is strategy and, and looking at ads and kind of having an, a sense of what might work. But then, of course, you actually have to back that up with data. So um, it's a nice little combo. Um, but um, personally, I also do like pickleball. And after a, a rigorous game of pickleball, I also like some delicious smoothies. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Hunter? All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Hunter Crane. I'm the digital marketing project manager at Inverb. Wow, this feedback is really odd. Um, so I'm basically the executor at Inverb with everything HubSpot. I get really fun ideas brought to me, whether it's from our clients or from Gina or Angie. And I find ways to make it happen in HubSpot, whether that's through the tools like workflows or marketing automation, everything. I, I find a way to make it happen outside of work. Uh, I'm big into weightlifting, working on my car. I've got an Audi, so I'm a car guy, and hanging out with my cat, Cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to pass this back over to Angie. Yeah, no, to Gina. Oh, to Gina, that's yeah, right. All right, so we're all here to learn about building strong ads, strong digital ad campaigns. We started with this idea of 200%, you know, plus ROI, but it starts with thinking about who are you trying to reach? Who are you trying to target? Let me get myself out of here. Um, so the talk, it's really important to talk about who you want to target, right? Because you can have the best campaign, the best strategy, the best creative ad copy, but if it's not targeted to the right people, you're just wasting your time and money. And so making sure that the ads are really speaking and connecting with the target audience is important, but how do you even know who that audience is? And when we talk about this, 200% you know, increase, this is a really big piece of that puzzle. 670% of increased click-through click rate because you're targeting a certain demographic or um, persona that really speaks to what you're selling, what you're offering. So another stat is that 80% of internet users are more likely to click on an ad that is targeted to their specific interests. So let's, let's use an example. Um, let's say you're a bank you might have actually a few different target audiences, but to keep it simple, you might have individual people who need a, a, a mortgage. Uh, so they're looking for a, a loan to buy a home. You would do all sorts of different tactics to reach that market than business owners who need a business loan. So this is where you begin. Who are you targeting and how do you even research that sort of thing. So, of course, there are tools online where you can do this. And one thing is obviously you have a website, you have social platforms, you can start there. So, if you have uh, Google Analytics set up on your site and you have, you're tracking the behavior and the activity, you can learn a lot about those people. For an example, let's say you were a health club 
and you notice that a lot of the traffic for people who are interested in becoming a member are females aged 25 to 34 with an interest in fitness and wellness. But then you also have more of a B2B type of business where you're doing like team building activities and that sort of thing. But on that page in Google Analytics, you see, oh, actually that's um, a males 41 to 47. They're kind of mid-level managers. They're interested in career development. So you're going to target them with way different messages and creatives and and even tactics, which sites are appropriate to really even, um, you know, focus on like is, for instance, Pinterest is big for, you know, females of a certain age and so on. So all of these things you take into account when you're looking into the audience and who you want to reach. And so starting with some research with some of the low hanging fruit of your website, Google Analytics, but also, of course, there's all the analytics that you can find on social and meta, which is Facebook and Instagram and many other things, but mainly all that data that they have, you can harvest not only the traffic that comes from your pages and your posts, but also they have tools there. Um, Facebook audience insights is one of them. And you can, you know, put in what you're looking for. When you're even building the ads, you you put in one idea that you have. So let's say you wanted to reach young moms who have children the age of zero to one. You can put that in, but then it'll start suggesting other audiences that you could target. And you can see how big those audiences are. You can you can pick different states and things like that. And and so these are all ways to begin to build that information about who you want to reach. Then you start to create this persona, kind of the fictional representation of who you're, you're reaching. And then as you get to know this person or this persona better, you're going to understand where do they live? Where do they work? Um, what are, is their demo, their age, their gender, their interests? But also very important are their goals. Like, what is it? What problem are you going to solve for them? That's really the main thing. How are you going to help them? Because if you aren't going to hit that pain point, they're not going to respond. So that's really key: is to understand the persona. But what problem are you going to solve for them? Otherwise, none of this will work. None of this will help them. They won't respond. And I gave. Let's see. Oh, I wanted to also mention, so you can also take your subscriber list, okay? So you might have, over the years, start to accumulate a very large subscriber list. You can upload those lists into Google, into Facebook, and then target them in LinkedIn. And you can target those people. So you can do ads specific to them depending on what what they've purchased how they've interacted with your company in the past you can make different groups of them you can also build look-alike audiences for these people so this especially in facebook so and instagram and this is a way to really target people who are similar to your um, people who've actually purchased and that's a wonderful technique to really hone in on the audience that might be most likely to be interested in what you, whatever product or service that you have. So now that you know who you want to reach, you really thought it through, how do you write compelling copy? And I know that uh, one of the people here is talking about SEO. A lot of this can apply to information you're putting in a website too and a landing page. So knowing the journey of the person and Hunter and Angie are going to talk a little more about that. I'm talking about the ads that kind of grab their attention. But one part we didn't put a lot in into this presentation is landing page. And so you want that message to be consistent from the ad to the landing page. Well, 
and and then the, like if you do subsequent email marketing to them all of that's going to be hitting the same message but in maybe different ways so what makes ad copy compelling one way to look at it is just what are your competitors doing you know see get ideas and research a little bit on what what are people who are out there doing the same sort of thing doing i'm going to talk a little more about that but that's one place to start another thing is making sure that you're you're careful in your words i mean you can see this ad here there's not a lot of text you don't want a billboard with a paragraph in it no one can read that much right you want few select but powerful impactful words that are actually going to speak to that person how are you going to solve their problem with a hook what is the what is the thing that will really you know kind of hit them when they see it you know you're driving down the highway you're driving down the internet highway and you're scrolling very quickly through your feed what is going to stop the scroll it's the the words that really pull people in to take action. Angie's gonna talk about images that'll help, you know, get their attention and give you a few more seconds to let them focus on your ad, but it's the words that are gonna pull them in and have them move forward in your funnel. In this example, um, it's basically like a successful fitness app. You might focus on the benefits of you know, in this case, this person looks very fit. Almost, you could say, you know, your workout perfected. It's implying it's got a perfect stature, right? So that would ring true to somebody who who doesn't have a lot of time to work out, but wants to have a, a better looking physique. And perfect is a word that will will hit them along with the in, image. And your workout, because we all have limited time, this audience is very keen on, I want to be the most, I want it to be the most efficient workout possible. So this is an example of how you can reach people in an effective way. You also wanna focus on unique selling points. So what is it in your copy that shows how you're different than your competitors? What is unique about you? What is why would they use you versus your competition? That's one of the first things I ask any client is what's special about whatever you offer. And that's what you need to make sure is clear in your copy, because otherwise it's, it's just all noise. Oh, they've seen it before. They've heard it before, but what is unique about what you do and how, or how you deliver whatever it is. So you want to highlight that you want to, you know, kind of smack them in the face a little bit with what's different about what you do. So for instance, if, if it were a fitness product that talked about real time tracking and you knew that you had some new part or new initiative or new innovation that really is different than the competitor, you want to highlight that you want to focus on that. If it were a tech company that did, um, project management, because we think about that all the time. Um, so more B2B example, then maybe it's technology that will help you track your expenses real time. And that was something that was really important to us. So as a client, you know, we knew that was important, but if you're actually marketing, so I actually went and looked at our project managed software and looked at what, what do their, ad, and they do have ads running on Facebook. And I, I looked at what their, um, putting in their ads, that would be the thing that would grab my attention, it would grab Angie's attention, and we'd be compelled to click on that ad and learn more if we weren't, you know, already using it. So that's another example. But so avoid jargon, by the way. I've seen a lot of, of ad copy and emails that you just have to strip it away. You're you're putting too many, you know, industry words that aren't really speaking to people. You want to use words that people are familiar with, they're comfortable with, they use every day. It's nice to throw in a few words that sound impressive, but you don't want if you don't want to add copy full of, of words that people are just going to tune out. 
you want to also use, like I said, as few as possible and write it in as clear a possible way. You don't want to write um, at a graduate level type of um, very sophisticated words because, again, people, you have seconds to get their attention with the language that you're using. Um, so I also wanted to mention that when you are looking at your competitors' ads, you can go on, Facebook is one place where they have an ad library. So you can just Google Facebook ad library and you can search for competitors there or you can search for topics too. Another way to do this is you can go to the page of the competitor on Facebook and those, there's like um, page transparency, you'll see that'll also get you kind of the same place. So you can see what your competitors are doing. But another little tip there is to see how long has that ad been running? Because it will tell you how long it's been running. If the ad's only been running a few days, then you don't know how well it's doing. But if it's been there months, you know it's been an effective ad. They wouldn't be spending that kind of money over and over, weeks after weeks, if it weren't working. So these are ways to... What, what are they saying? What's concise and impressive about the language they're using in that ad? Obviously don't want to make it the same, but you can get ideas of how you can do better than what they're doing. Call to actions are super important. Um, so here are the stats. So personalized call to actions convert 202% more visitors into leads than untargeted call to actions. So this is also really important. There's only a, so much copy you can put in there, right? I'm telling you not to use a lot of words. So the call to action is really what's going to get them from looking at whatever the ad is to the page where or wherever you want to send them. And it has to, it can't be general. It can't be um, you know, something very loose. It, it has to be something very targeted. So, for example, um, sign up today, buy now. On um, Facebook, actually, what tends to work the best is learn more. That sounds a little general, but that does work very well for Facebook ads and, and Instagram ads. Um, but you can, like, sign up today. I mean, people looking at these ads aren't thinking about a week from now. They're thinking about this instance. They want to do something now to move forward with whatever they're interested in. So that's why you want to do call to actions that really move things forward and get them to take the type of action you're looking for, the type of action that means something to them. So you're getting them to go, go through your funnel, click on your ads, but another really important part that I think a lot of people don't do is retargeting. And that means, first of all, let me just give you an idea. Have you ever been, um, I'm sure we all have, we've been online, we've seen something we liked, we put in a shopping cart, or maybe you even just clicked on it. Now, everywhere you go online, you're seeing, let's say it's a pair of shoes on, on Macy's, right? Uh, those shoes will follow you wherever you go. I call it your stalker ad. It doesn't leave you, right? It, and it's just there over and over again to remind you how much you want to do. And it, it doesn't have to be um, anything that you even put in a shopping cart. It's just showing that you took some action on some ad. And how do you set that up? There's all sorts of tools. that, And it starts with putting tracking codes on your site using the codes so there's tags on Google, there's pixels on Facebook. They're all basically codes that you set up on the pages, either the landing page or the website page, wherever you're driving the traffic. So then you can see the behavior of how people are interacting with the ad and after the ad. But also, more importantly, Facebook and Google can see what's happening. So you can set up ads that are lead ads or conversion ads. So are people actually converting? Are they actually buying? And the more Facebook sees that or Google sees that, the better those ads begin to perform, the better you can optimize. But it all starts with making sure you've set these up 
the right way. You could set up a Google Tag Manager and put them all in there. You can set them up directly into your site. So there's many ways to do this, but it's the first step and you got to make sure to do it. So then you have the opportunity to retarget people. And if people go to your site, now you are able to, or they take some specific action. Now you can, of course, retarget them any way you want, LinkedIn, Facebook. You can even retarget people on different platforms. Like I said, you could take um, that information and use it to target people in different ways, which is really helpful um, because the more places people see your messaging, the more they're impressed, the more they they, you know, hear about you, understand you, more familiar with you, the more likely they're going to take action. What some reasons, so I should mention also that you don't want to say the same message to the, the person, right? You, they, um, some examples, but you don't want to tell people who got a, let, let's say they wanted a free sample of something, they signed up for that, but they haven't purchased yet, you want to send them a different message. They've already got the free sample. Now what do you want them to do? So you can send them things like testimonials, special offers, discounts, eBooks, depending on if it's more of a B2B or if it's a B2C type of person that you're trying to target. Um, it's also a great tactic if you're looking for people who are, you know, it's more of a longer cycle type of sale. It, it's, it's something that they have to consider. It's more expensive. It just takes more time. So this type of retargeting is really going to help nurture that lead, that person who showed some interest because they clicked somewhere within one of your ads or your landing pages. So these are tactics you can use to continue to retarget them. And it could be a video testimonial. It could be just text, you know, like a little quote that, you know, I you know, love this product so much and that sort of thing. But it's really just important to, to understand that in this stat, it's saying SEO pros say retargeting is underused 46% of the time. And absolutely, I agree with that because when we work with clients, they're just thinking about, you know, I want this person to click this ad and go here and do this thing. And they're not thinking about the behavior of most people is it's not that simple, right? Most, we're just not that simple. We need to be reminded over and over again in different ways and how it can help solve their problem and different people reinforcing it through testimonials or, oh, here's a special, you know, that might be the one thing that helps push them over to actually take action. So I'm gonna pause a minute because next Angie's up, but I wanted to give people a, you know, a minute to ask any questions before we move on to the idea of compelling creative and design. Yes. I have a question. Um, so for the agency I work for in travel, yes. um, their Facebook ads, she, she encourages us to make them a little bit longer, almost to look like a Facebook post instead of an ad mm -hmm. and use like real pictures of us at Disney with our kids. So I wonder if you agree with that. I know you really highlighted trying to keep them short and simple and sweet. Is there a time where you would encourage a more, I don't know, like simple ad that looks more like a Facebook post instead of an ad? Right. So the question, just in case people didn't hear, is are there times, especially on social, when you would use more language, more of a, a longer type of, description in the ad so it looks like an actual post rather than an ad and absolutely I do agree with that and there are time and place for all of these things all these different tactics and I've used that numerous times and it has been effective and the best thing to do is really to test you can start with very short copy medium copy long copy and see what resonates with your target audience so for instance, I mentioned the, the young mom who's got the baby, they read everything that has to do with babies. So you start telling a story about, you know, um, how, how you managed to make it through Disneyland or Disney World um, with a, you know, a toddler and a baby and here are the tips. 
they're going to read every word and they're going to soak it up. So again, know your target audience, know who wants to hear the story. Whereas if it's, um, you know, a person who's all about just getting um, a fitness app and they just want to know what's the latest cool technology, they're not necessarily going to want a big, long thing. So, but again, you can test it. It could be a story that is compelling and, and that does work well, uh, especially Facebook. So that's a great question. Yes. I actually have a comment. Thank you for putting together the persona. Oh, um, great. What I definitely recommend though is for personas, maybe have a audience's, your target audience's journey on there too. So it's like doing a Facebook ad. I know when people do Facebook ads, they have call to actions, but when you're setting up your kind of your target audience or your um, reach, make sure to that you're kind of not holding the hand, but giving them a process of what the next steps are and you're retargeting them. Yes. So it was a comment saying to remind us that when you are building out um, your persona to also build the journey that goes with the persona. And actually Hunter's gonna talk about that. <laughs> and we did a little bit out of order. <laughs> I was telling him, don't hand out the sheets until you're talking. But um, yeah, he's actually gonna go into that a little bit more. But absolutely, you, you wanna map, you wanna think this through a blueprint, however you wanna call it, of that journey and you, you want to think about how from A to Z, how are you going to get them from A to Z? And Hunter's going to talk a little more about that. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, I do use HubSpot. I have a landing page in HubSpot. And okay. I cannot for the life of me figure out how to get a pixel for a Facebook ad on my HubSpot landing page. That's something that they can do, right? Do you know? Yes, absolutely. And again, there's multiple ways to do it. Um, you know, you can actually put things on a specific button you, or call to action. Um, you can put it in the code, in the header. You can do it through integrations and in the settings. You, you could do it, you could have a Google Tag Manager and just put the Google Tag Manager in, in the integration settings. I think the easiest thing, I mean, we might be able to as a follow-up, put some instructions, but probably the best thing is HubSpot has great customer service. Giving them a call, they, they're so good about, you know, walking you through step-by-step, step. and then you can have your computer open with everything, and then if you get a little snag, they can help you get over that hump and get, get it taken care of pretty quickly. So that's what I recommend because that's, um, and in fact, you, what's also great about HubSpot is you can do like A-B testing your, your landing pages. So if you want to try one offer versus another, one discount versus another, or, you know, different things, you can test that and you can set it up so it goes, to, you know, half here, half there, and then you can pick the winner and then just let them all go to the winner. So there's cool stuff you can do there too. Any other questions? All right. So the ads we're talking about today, you can't really have without the visual, right? Of course, there's search ads that are just great copy and call to action, but we're talking about uh, a more encompassing topic of ads, and that includes the visuals. So like Gina was saying, it is all about the audience, and that's not just when we talk about copy, it's also when we talk about the visuals. Research shows that different colors, for example, evoke different emotions. So you've got to al align your design choices to those desired emotional responses. If you're a fitness company, we're gonna use fitness as an example through a lot of this presentation. So I hope you all like that. Uh, if you're a fitness company, you may wanna evoke energy and excitement around your brand. So vibrant colors like red and orange can be really effective to that end. Of course, you wanna keep it on brand. Visuals should be attention grabbing, relevant to your message, but also reflect your brand identity. If it doesn't look like your brand, it's gonna be very forgettable. For instance, again, if your fitness brand promotes a sense of empowerment and strength, you wanna use images of confident individuals who are achieving their fitness milestones like this gentleman here. Grab their attention, 
Connect with your audience by tapping into their emotions, aspirations, or their pain points. Uh, a fitness ad, for example, can feature a powerful image of a person overcoming obstacles to achieve their fitness goals and evoke determination and inspiration, like this example here. Something that people don't always consider when we're talking about ads is optimization. So when we talk about optimizing a website, people are very familiar with that, right? I gotta make sure that it loads quickly or Google page speed will yell at me. You also have to optimize your ads. So mobile usage continues to rise. It's crucial to optimize your ads for that seamless mobile experience. It's predicted that 69% of the overall advertisement spending will be generated via smartphones in 2023. So it's no joke. You gotta optimize your ads. As part of that optimization, you always wanna make sure that you're thinking about that clear hierarchy of information. So does the hierarchy work for a desktop user? Does it work for a mobile user? Make sure you're looking at it in every scenario. Now this slide is not meant to offend, but uh, keep it simple, stupid, right? It's a really easy acronym to remember and it is something we should live by. It's a lot easier to get your point across when there's less you're trying to fit into your teeny tiny advertising space. So in, I've got three examples that I'm gonna show you and I'm gonna walk you through. I, I'm gonna call it like a good, better, best scenario. So in this first example, I would call this a well-designed ad. It, it's enticing, right? It's got beautiful typography. It's got the call to action. What's missing here is a really clear brand. At a glance, could you tell what brand this is? I sure couldn't. And in addition, they've got some kind of silly details like the phone number and some copy you can't even really read. Not super great, right? So while it is a beautiful visual, I wouldn't call it the most effective of the ads. This next sample is from Apple, which everyone when you think of Apple is like, oh, it's beautiful, right? It's my favorite thing. Uh, it is a really good ad. I'm not saying it's bad. It's better than the one I just showed you. It's got a clear brand at least. It's got that beautiful typography. It's got a clear call to action. But again, we're getting a little bit more details than we probably need, especially on a, a display ad type of ad. So better, but not the best. Now, some of you might argue that this is not as visually pleasing, but I'm gonna call this the best, right? You've got a really, really clear brand. It's the brand colors. At a glance, this feels like the brand. It's got a nice headline, a clear call to action, and it's really simple. So I'm gonna call that the best. So, all right, I showed you some good examples. Now I'm gonna show you what not to do. Uh, less is more when it comes to ads. I think we covered that in the last slide. Digital ads in particular need to function more like a billboard, like Gina was saying, right? That really enticing headline. You've got a couple of seconds to grab their attention. So while you might think it's important to cram as much information as possible onto your ad, you got to remember, you're trying to get them to click. The landing page is the opportunity to add all those extra details, add your fine print there, add all the nuances of your offer there. What you need to do is focus on getting them to click. Ads with too much information are gonna feel like work for your viewer. They're gonna scroll right on past. So here's another example of bad, bad. Just don't do it. <laughs> Compelling design for your audience. Everyone's got an opinion. So much of what's gonna resonate with your audience is gonna depend on who that audience is. What one audience finds gaudy and over the top, another audience is gonna find classy and on point. The fitness club ad that you see doesn't appeal to me, <laughs> but it checks all the boxes of what would be considered a good ad, right? I'm not the audience for that one. The Apple fitness ad does speak to me and it's much more compelling in my opinion. <laughs> As someone who works full-time and finds it hard to find the time to fit a workout in, this ad has my number, and I love Apple. The tips we've provided here uh, can still be universally applied regardless of your audience. You need to know who that audience is, though. That's really what it comes down to. You need to make it applicable to your brand. 
And finally, at the end of the day, effective ads are gonna be in the eye of the beholder. It's all gonna come down to your audience and testing what works. And then again, and again. Do we have any questions before we move on? All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Hunter who's gonna cover nurturing the lead. So Gina's gonna help pass out the blueprint that we were talking about that gave my presentation away over here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's exactly what you need to do when preparing these ads. Once we develop our copy and we think about the path that we want these people to take, uh, and after developing the graphics, you do have to figure out what you wanna do with them once you have them in HubSpot and as a lead, because there are some next steps you have to take to keep your company top of mind as the lead comes in. So you may just wonder, well, I have this ad, I sent them my offer and they signed up. Can that be it? Can I just be done? It's possible, but we don't recommend it. That's not quite the best route to take. In some cases, that is something you can do, just sending an offer and being done if you want to be one and done. But if you want successful converting leads, there's more to it. So that's done through nurturing. And from a high, high level point of view, whether it's in HubSpot or outside of HubSpot, it's important to continue to follow up with your leads after the offer is sent and providing fresh content often. So we recommend and we have found that providing fresh content at least 50% of the time is at a minimum the best route to take, meaning for every two emails that you're sending in your nurture sequence over time, at least one of them has to provide fresh content. So if you want to send your initial offer and then send a follow-up email and call back to the content you just provided them, the next email should provide at least some form of new content. And on top of that, you want to have a clear next step in any, any one of your emails, just like on your ads. You want a clear call to action that is relevant and compelling for them to take and gives them a clear definition on where to go next. Because if you don't, and they open your emails, you won and open from them, if they don't know what to do next, that's not the best view that they may have for your business. You want a clear next step for them to take. And by doing that and defining your next step, it's important to consider all the steps they could take and at what point they get, they get handed off from the marketing team to your sales team. So I meant to mention, as we're going through this section, this is gonna be pretty B2B specific where sales cycles sales cycles are going to be longer and a little more intimate in this particular portion it's going to be relevant to marketing where universal relatively universal messaging is going to take place you still want to segment out your audiences but just before sales is going to step in and get very unique with their and personal with their messaging so that's where this life cycle stage blueprint comes into play and now this is a pretty high level document that hubspot has provided and it's essentially a high level overview of all the stages that someone could take from being a lead all the way to becoming a customer and evangelist for your business. And now these map directly to stages within HubSpot that you can mark these leads as. And you see at the very top, uh, after they become a lead, they get handed off to sales. Now this is relatively simple on this spreadsheet but it may not be so simple for your business. It's gonna vary by industry, by business, when that handoff takes place and how long that takes, but it's important to establish that first because that is gonna help decide how you structure your nurturing over time. Now, are there any questions on this so far? This is a pretty high level document and there's a lot to it. So just, I recommend just taking it as a grain of salt right now, but keeping it as a framework for when you develop workflows or edit your workflows that you may have um, and we'll email it after this, especially for the people online. Um, but yeah, are there any questions so far? Hunter, can you just go through what each of the, the high level um, titles are of the boxes along the top? Like, what does that mean? Yeah. So I'm going to have to bring this over a little bit. So the, the top column that we're seeing, the top row, we've got life cycle stage, definition, tools, trigger. Marketing team responsibilities, sales team responsibilities, and service team responsibilities. So what this is broken down is on the left, far left column, the life cycle stage that is a high level 
lead, marketing qualified lead, sales qualified lead, all the way to evangelist at the bottom. And then a brief definition that HubSpot provides just as a guide for what that means in terms of HubSpot and the customer journey. And then you'll see the specific tools within HubSpot that you'll need to action that and bring it into HubSpot and integrate it entirely. The specific trigger that will define when that takes place. Like I said, it's still unique to your business and industry, but it's, it's vague enough here that it'll help you apply it to your industry or business uh, wherever necessary. And then the final three are where the marketing team, sales team and service team, their responsibilities come into play. The, again, this isn't relevant to every business that's out there. This is for the businesses with the longer sales cycles, more B2B type industries. However, it could still be applicable for the shorter sales cycles companies because you could take on multiple roles at a time. It's just a nice distinction to know when that will take place, when you're supposed to go put your sales cap on or your service cap on once they become a customer and you have to retain them over time. So the reason that's beneficial is because of a tool within HubSpot called Workflows. And I've been throwing that here and there, throwing it out there. Has anyone here worked with HubSpot Workflows? So, um, the company I work for has marketing automation for let's say something called the drip that they trigger the leads and then they change their thing and then it triggers a workflow of a series of emails. Yeah. I don't personally build those workflows, but we have them. Okay, so you know of it, but you've never worked within it. Correct. Perfect. Okay, so you're gonna learn a little bit about how those are built why they're built and the kind of things you can do with it. So workflows is HubSpot's way of describing branching logic, email drip sequences. Those are terms that are pretty universal, but HubSpot's definition is, is workflows. And they can be extremely powerful if you utilize their potential. There are a bunch of different tools within them, like if then statements, time delays, paid views, and targeting specific contact properties. And that's one of the things that I personally love about HubSpot that separates it. It's a USP separate from other branching logic softwares is that you can specifically target CRM properties because it is a CRM at the end of the day. So you could establish um, targeting based on where someone lives, where they went to college, if that's a contact property you wanted to target. The possibilities are literally endless because you define them. And so you can set the properties from the get-go and then target that within HubSpot. And so you can see a di diagram on the right that sort of gives a, a brief outline of a simple workflow. And this is what's called a mini map view that you can see within HubSpot. It's not directly what you'll see when building a workflow. It's a little bit more uh, detailed when you're building it out. But at the top, there is a trigger that's the very top box. And then there is a branching logic if then statement at the third box down. And then you can see how it splits out. If a contact meets a certain trigger type criteria, they'll end up in the green category. If they don't meet it, they'll end up in the right on the red category. And these can get pretty complex or they can be as simple as you want. We recommend a nice balance, but sometimes they do require a pretty complex layout. On the right, you'll see a, a workflow that I, that I helped set up for one of our university clients that was extremely complex. And it targeted a lot of different contact properties with additional follow-up emails if they didn't happen to open one of the emails, um, additional branching logic if they didn't view a certain web page. There are a ton of different things that, that you could go into using those contact properties that I mentioned. And so after building those workflows, and getting that structure set up using that life cycle stage blueprint as a framework, you then can tailor your messaging however you want, knowing that it'll be segmented however you set it up. And so like I had mentioned, you can break it out with almost any contact property that you want using those if then statements. So if you had, say for example, you were a university client and you had a form submission that you wanted to post on a landing page, and there was a radio button that said, I am from, or I plan to go to a Michigan campus or a Louisiana campus. They aren't gonna think about that much, but they're gonna think about it. The prospect will think about it in terms of what they care about and where they end up wanting to go. 
but you will care about it because that can directly be a contact property that you target in a future if then statement. And you can break out leads into three different audiences. Audience A could be people that intend to go to college at the Michigan campus. Audience B can be the people that intend to go to the Louisiana campus. And then C can be the catch all if they happen to say, I'm not sure where I wanna go on that third radio button option. You can provide just simple um, universal messaging that isn't tailored to any specific campus, but is still targeted enough because they entered your workflow. It's not great that they didn't give a specific campus that they wanted to go to, but it's still relevant because they still ended up in your workflow. And the beauty of that is these workflows give you confidence that the messaging that you're providing is getting to the right person at the right time every time. You know, this is beneficial if anyone here has been in sales, it could it starts to get really confusing if you don't have a great CRM on who belongs to what, who is from where, who cares about what. The workflows will automate all that for you prior to the sales handoff. Obviously, there's still that that interaction that has to take place after the sales handoff, but this takes that hard work and headache out of what exactly do I need to be saying to them? What did they care about? Instead of doing this one-on-one, -on -one, the workflows will automate everything for you and get you the verbiage directly to them that you care about, that you want them to see. And if it's not targeted enough, it's still universal if they didn't end up in that segment that you wanted to, like for the people that didn't know what campus they wanted to, to end up at. You know, one beautiful thing about workflows that we've utilized a lot at Inverve is goal criteria. And so this isn't a super widely talked about tool that HubSpot has, but it is a little setting when you're in the workflow uh, setting, I'll say within HubSpot, it says goals right at the top next to settings. And what this will allow you to do is track your conversions and essentially figure out how well your workflow is working over time. It's great for define, you basically can define whatever you want the goal to be. So it's user defined that can be bittersweet because there are considerations yet that you have to consider before building it. Now I'm gonna run through these here. The main purpose of a goal is to track conversions, but that also means that they will be removed from the workflow. HubSpot will view that as a successful workflow path and take them out of the workflow so they will not see anything else throughout the remainder of the workflow if they happen to, to complete your goal halfway through it. Now, when I say that you can set the goal criteria for whatever you want it to be, it could be as simple as viewing a web page, viewing an external web page that you don't even own. It can still track that. It can track things like form submissions, if they booked a discovery call through one of your HubSpot meeting links. Uh, all those things are things they can track. It can track if they open a marketing email. But you want to be purposeful and consider that whenever they do this, they will be taken out of that workflow and not see anything else. And one step further from that, on the second bullet point, only contacts that have been sent a marketing email in that workflow will count to towards the goal criteria. So that means that within the workflows, you have to, at some point, send at least one marketing email for them to count towards the goal. Now that could mean you could have a workflow as big as this one right here on the right, but if there's not a single marketing email in there, it's not gonna count. So there could be branching logic and adding them to lists, but there's gotta be at least one email in there. That being said, that will kind of tie into how complex or simple you wanna make the, the workflow. And that kind of works to your benefit using these goal criteria because as long as you have a workflow set up and turned on, a prospect or lead could complete that workflow goal at any time after the workflow is turned on or after they complete the workflow. So that means that if I had, let's say, for example, that I enter a workflow that is five days long, there's five emails, one email per day. If I completed the goal criteria, the second I was enrolled in that workflow, I submitted a form or sign up for a discovery call. I'm going to be taken out of that workflow and not receive anything that's in there. On the flip side, if I went through the entire sequence and five months later, I booked the discovery call, it would still count as a conversion within the workflow settings. So all that being said, the most important thing, like Angie said, 
is testing, monitoring, analyzing, adjusting, and optimizing everything that you have built because there are opportunities for anomalies to take place. And the last thing you want is to have be running a campaign or building out a workflow that has an error or some bad data that was triggered months before and you never caught it. And so now you have six months of data that you got to clean up or fix because you didn't track it. So we recommend, it sounds like a lot, but tracking things daily, checking on your ads daily, watching your workflows, watching the email behavior, checking bounce rates on your pages and your ads and landing pages and seeing what works and what doesn't. Like Gina said, you may find out that a whole page of text works better for your audience than a single line of text. You may find out that the same works for your emails, a whole string of an email that's almost like an essay works better for your audience rather than something simple and to the point and providing an, an instant offer. So all in all, test, monitor, optimize, and adjust everything at all times to catch anomalies before they get worse over time. Any questions?